So, uh, yeah, man, let's just start this off by you giving us a little bit about what you do. What is it that you do? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, I guess there are two ways to answer that. Um, what I do is sort of in my day-to-day -day life. Um, in that area, I work as a psychologist. So that's what I do uh, basically to, to make a living. Um, right now, I'm working in psychological assessment, but I used to work in clinical psychology and in clinical neuropsychology as well. Um, but right now, I'm freelancing. And for the most part, it's psychological assessment. And uh, yeah, apart from that, I also last year started a YouTube channel where I pretty much just explore my interests in, in spirituality and awakening and everything that is sort of adjacent to that. And uh, that's also taking up quite a bit of my uh, free time now. And it's sort of, I, I guess it's becoming a bit of a job, but it doesn't really feel like it because it's just, yeah something I love to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically in a broad sense what I do. Cool, man. All right. So yeah, about your YouTube channel, how would you explain what it's all about to somebody that has no idea about what the spirituality, awakening, non-duality is about? How would you summarize what you talk about? Yeah, it's, that's a really good question. I, I think it's it's not even not necessarily even that easy to answer because you know for the most part I have the luxury that the people who want to speak to me are actually really in, interested in this stuff, you know. So they bring a lot of background knowledge, and I don't need to do a lot of explaining of the basics. Yeah. And then in my ordinary life, I never really feel compelled to speak about spirituality or awakening or any any of that stuff too much. You know, it's it, it's it's just not something. I guess I, I I don't really feel a strong urge to convince anybody of anything, but 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 also not that. Even though I I see that, you know, engaging with with these matters is so profoundly helpful. Um, I nevertheless I I don't feel the urge to kind of shove it down somebody's throat. You know, if somebody wants to talk about it and is open to these kinds of topics, then that's great. You know, then then I'll happily jump into it. But um, yeah, for the most part, you know, I, I'm not really in the position where I have to to answer that that question. But yeah, nevertheless, you know, how would I um, kind of summarize what this is all about for me? You know, the the way I the way I view spirituality and awakening is really ultimately in a very pragmatic sense. To me, it's just based on the recognition that there is the possibility of suffering. And there is the possibility of well-being. Mm -hmm. And we all know that there is the possibility of suffering. I mean, <laughs> uh, we don't have to live for very long to, to know that that's on the menu. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when it comes to well-being, it's really that we don't know what kind of well-being is actually possible. You know, we, yeah. we have a very narrow idea of what well-being is. And our ideas of what well-being is, is, is really fundamentally based on maybe what we've been taught, what we've been kind of even indoctrinated into to some degree, and very strongly also on what our self-identity is. You know, depending on what we take ourselves to be, we have associated with that a very strong idea of what we need in order to be fulfilled. Mm. But in this whole kind of quest for just more well-being, you know, better, better states of mind, we usually don't acknowledge the possibility that there is a radically different way of being and that there is the possibility of recognizing that what this experience is, what the reality of our experience is, is fundamentally and transcendentally different from what we believe it is. Uh -huh. And so that's on the menu as well. And <laughs> maybe if you're lucky enough or if you just get frustrated enough with um, our life, or we perceive it in our ordinary way, our suffering just gets too much as, as the case for a lot of people. Um, maybe we open up to this different way of orienting to our experience and discovering some truths about it, or at the very least, the possibility of a very different way of experiencing and then finding that 
the amount of well-being that's actually possible is yeah, it's, it's it's sort of not even something we were capable of imagining before. Mm. So that's not exactly a short answer, but I think broadly speaking, that is my orientation to awakening and, yeah. and spirituality. That was a good answer, though. So you're saying well-being, our experience of well-being is tied into how we view ourselves, our um, identity, I guess you could say. And that is kind of like they're correlated with each other. Absolutely. And, and you know, even from a kind of ordinary way of looking at things, we can all sort of acknowledge that this is true. You know, just uh, forget all about spirituality and, 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 and all that, that, kind of, that kind of way of thinking. But even just in a very ordinary sense that we know that we know that in, in certain situations we have. So I, I growing up, for example, I had this acute sense of social anxiety, you know, and it was very much tied to how I imagined myself to be and also my idea of how I thought others would view me, you know. And so whenever I was in a, in a social situation, my way of experiencing was defined by this kind of contraction, a trimming down, a feeling of being limited, of being very identifiable. Mm. And of course, if this is how you go through life, you know, and if this is how you engage with people, then suffering is kind of the natural consequence, you know. But even then, you know, even when I had these kinds of difficulties, I also just really, for example, I, I, I love sports, you know, and martial arts in particular. And there, my, my sense of what I am and what the world is really shifted into something different. You know, there, all of a sudden, I was relieved of this kind of neurotic grasping to an identity and could just be with my experience in a very open and dynamic and responsive way. And all of a sudden... There's some lightness, there's spaciousness, peace, you know, and that is just the ordinary kind of way of orienting to experience. But when we discover that there is such a thing as awakening, it's very much about, to me, about noticing that you can actually deliberately shift into a different way of being, so to say. You don't need to wait for the perfect circumstances. You don't need to change yourself in any fundamental way or change the way other people view you, there's actually the possibility of sort of stepping out of that completely and finding a way of experiencing that's totally transcendent of all of that, which then eventually also goes back into the perspective of the person. But nevertheless, this kind of step of transcending and, and seeing that, okay, there is a wholeness, a well-being, a peace that is not tied to my self-identity or my kind of relative conditions. That is a, a fundamental shift that is possible. Mm. So how would you say one goes down that route of finding that wholeness, that, uh, that liberation? Yeah, that's of course the the million dollar question, right? Yeah, <laughs> and you so it know that depends on the person. Yes, it, it it really depends on the person. You know, I, I I sort of have an an idea of a of a map that I think works or can be useful for a lot of people. But I really enjoy working with people in kind of mm -hmm. a one on one setting, because then there's really the possibility of listening to someone and understanding where are their particular fixations, you know, and what kind of limiting beliefs do they have? Where do they struggle? You know, because that is really different for everybody. And mm -hmm. even though maybe the realization eventually is kind of the same for everybody, the way we get there and the particular challenges we have, they can really differ, you know? And uh, I think taking kind of dynamic approach that is really sort of skillful and wise and responsive and which emerges out of, I'd say, your own recognition of this. I think that's really the way to go. And I'm generally speaking, I'm really not a, a fan of kind of hammering one particular uh, map or model or way of looking um, into people. I think this is the way to go. You have to, to go this way. You have to re realize it this way. 
I think, um, yeah, more kind of dynamic and intelligent approach, um, generally speaking, is, is the way to go. Yeah, I agree. Ultimately, though, it comes down to like, you got to be the one to really want it, you know? It's good to have guidance and people like you and podcasts like this, but ultimately it comes down to the person really yearning for that freedom. And I think we all have that. I think every single person has that deep down within, like we want that sense of freedom to be freed from the shackles of the ego, you could say. But I don't think we know where to look. Or yeah. how to go about this? You know, what is the process to this? Right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it depends on the person, but ultimately, the person is the one that has to, you know, do it. They have to save themselves in a way. You know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the the traditional kind of explanation in Eastern spirituality is, of course, karma. You know, that some people are inclined to to go down this path, and, and others aren't. I don't know if I buy that completely, if, if that's really true, but just, we can also just acknowledge that, yeah, for some people, strangely, there is interest in these matters and for others, there isn't at all, you know, and it's almost like you can say what I said in the beginning when you asked me what this is about, basically, but I don't think even if I, if I explain that to, to, to somebody that they will ne necessarily buy that, you know, they yeah. kind of think, Kind of interesting but sam's also a bit weird and i don't know if i uh, should really go along with that you know and they just and the next thing they do is like okay what do we eat for dinner and they're back in, in the flow of life you know and yeah so there's something strange about that you never know where if it's going to land for somebody mm. one has to be receptive absolutely yeah and, and that that will you you described you know it's it, it really is a a strange thing you know and you know, I think everybody who sort of is interested in, in awakening, they can kind of trace back in their life how the sort of w where the seed was planted, maybe, and, yeah. and how eventually they arrived here, you mm -hmm. know, but that process still is sort of mysterious, you know, that there's still something about it, which we we can't quite explain, you know, even though I really like to demystify awakening and make it very kind of approachable and my basic outlook is that everybody can do this 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 doesn't require anything special mm -hmm. you know because sometimes you have this idea that you need to wait for some kind of magical transcendental way uh, event you know but that's really not my outlook you know I, I think you can really go about it in a very deliberate way but whether you are even interested in that in the first place you know there's not much to be done there i think you i guess you can get good at giving a kind of sales pitch you know but who knows if that's going to be effective yeah it's not that easy yeah it seems to me what it comes down to is personally speaking and also from what i observed in others wanting to or knowing that or maybe having some kind of inclination that there's got to be another way to find this so-called happiness, find so-called joy or peace in our life. There's got to be another way to go about it. I think what I talked about before, like we all have that yearning. I think it's a yearning for actually enjoying life, actually finding some kind of semblance of some kind of joy in this life. Um, but I don't know, man, what gets us on that wavelength? You just like you reached your limit to like uh, the your, your suffering essentially your your failings and trying to find it in the external world, right? I think there's just something that happens, and like you said, it might be karma in someone's life where it just says, "No, wait, hold on, that ain't it." I'm gonna figure out what is it <laughs> per se. It, yes, and, uh, yes. I don't know. Yeah, it's different for everybody. Yeah, I think suffering is definitely a big, big piece of it. I mean, it was definitely in, in my case. I, it was almost like I kind of had to be thoroughly cracked open for this to even become a possibility for me. Yeah. I had to sort of reach the point where I realized that I, as a kind of separate entity, will never be able to cope with life in a really kind of healthy and wise and fulfilling way. No, I mean, surviving in of itself is 
not too difficult nowadays. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of not a really high bar to clear. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of realized that the way I oriented towards life, there was something fundamentally wrong there. And then eventually there was a real kind of breaking point that cracked open maybe my 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 put my my acceptance for something a bit more mystical you know mm -hmm. something that kind of transcends what i believe myself to be and mm -hmm. that was certainly fundamental for me and i think it's for you know i mean i talk to people about this quite frequently now and it's almost always the case that suffering is the the driving factor there are people who also just have a kind of intellectual interest in this which is great you know but for for the most part i think yeah suffering plays a big part in that mm -hmm. mm. yeah and it's funny because we could use words as transcend and mystical or ascend to your higher self and the labels go on but i feel like <clears throat> that's not really doing it justice in the yeah. way that it's like actually normal you know i think it's yes like, we're just coming back to our innate nature, like what we actually are. <laughs> it's not something that, like you said, this some kind of uh, crazy event in one's life and all of a sudden the gates of heaven open and you get the message. It's kind of, I don't know, it's actually quite normal if that is even the right word, you know? It's like this is how life is supposed to feel, it seems. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's it's almost, you know, that living a truly kind of intimate, interconnected life where we feel engaged with what we're doing and connected to the people around us and appreciating the beauty of life is almost only possible from a kind of awakened view. And I say almost only because I don't mean to say that it's only possible this way. I know a lot of people who have no interest in spirituality and they, they seem, they're very psychologically healthy people. And so I don't feel the desire to kind of convince them of, of this. But for me, at least, I couldn't function in this way, in a kind of healthy way, um, without this kind of upgrading first. Upgrade. But like you said, that, you know, the, I use a lot of words that kind of indicate transcendence, a kind of waking up out of this reality. But, that really is only a first kind of step in my view. You know, if there is not then, you know, kind of using the word non-duality maybe to explain this, there, there is first the step that I see, which is essential to discover the non-duality between this awake emptiness, which we discover, and our field of perceptions. So everything we are experiencing, um, seeing, hearing, tasting, feeling, and so on. But then also, the other non-duality, which maybe sometimes gets overlooked, is the non-duality between this awakening and just our ordinary life and actually not drawing a distinction there, you know, mm -hmm. making this transcendent realization, you know, not something that is separate from the way you speak and talk and feel and act, you know, so that this kind of transcendent awake emptiness in my day-to-day -day life is not separate from the way I speak to my wife. You know, they're one sentence, you know, they're one breath, you know, you, you can't pull them apart at all. And I think bridging that kind of gap, you know, that the non-duality between that is yeah. absolutely essential for anything I would consider awakening, you know, I because agree. it's also possible to get fixated and stuck in a sort of transcendence. And I can, say from my own experience that that's also a possibility mm -hmm. <laughs> of happening yeah. yeah it could be a trap in itself yeah i agree i agree i feel like that's the most important part too is bringing this essence into our regular life because like you said that's just the first step but the second step is actually integrating it in um yeah being a willing instrument i guess you could say of i like to say of god but you don't even have to say god you know just be um, uh, a sort of servant, you know, because I feel as though, and maybe you can answer this as well, um, a different inclination in my being, a different orientation in my being comes about knowing that I am sort of interconnected with 
everything in my environment and everyone in my environment. I seem to always have that in the back of my head and from that treat myself and the world differently. Um, would you agree? Is there a different orientation in the way that you say, speak to your wife? A absolutely. And, and, and not just to the people who are sort of my, like my intimate partner or my family or things like that, but just in general, it's a, it's a different kind of way of experiencing and orienting to, to everybody around you, each and everyone you meet, you know, in my, my job as a psychologist, I constantly meet people from all walks of life, a lot of times criminals, you know, sometimes people who have been in prison, who have um, like for even like pretty brutal things like assault. And recently I assessed somebody who uh, robbed people with, with knives and then another people who stabbed people and one and, and fled the country for a couple of years. Mm. So, so all, all kinds of people and people where there would naturally be a kind of say, sense of wanting to protect yourself of their presence i'd say you know which in some situations i guess that's also healthy is i'm not saying that we need to get rid of that completely that's absolutely an adequate response in some situations but when they're when i'm speaking with them and i'm doing this psychological assessment then that should really be an opportunity for them to feel that they are accepted they feel this openness this interconnectedness they they feel in a sense they feel that radiating from you relatively speaking you know and from my perspective when i'm meeting them i really have the chance of kind of contracting into my self identity and trying to protect myself or judging them of course because what they did is horrible i mean that's mm. there's no way of yeah. other way of of speaking about that you know? but is there also the possibility of meeting them openly in an open-hearted way, nevertheless, you know? And I would say there very much much is. And, you know, it's it's very much like kind of moments to moments apparent in my interactions with them because sometimes I feel like these contractions coming up and it's almost like there is a choice to latch onto that, grasp onto that, mm. or to kind of relax from that and open to what's already inherently established here. And with that, already there's this spaciousness, wholeness, and importantly, this interconnectedness to the person you are speaking with. So you can meet them in a truly open-hearted way, which from your kind of self-identity is quite hard to do. Yeah. And, you know, the, the feedback I'm getting from these people is that they're amazed a lot of times about how I'm treating them, even though I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. I'm just treating them like... A completely normal person, mm -hmm. but they're so used to being judged, you know, yeah. to being kind of looked down upon, you know, to being treated like trash, you know, like criminals, that this kind of totally normal way of being, like this just relaxed, open way of being, touches them like in a kind of profound way, you know, mm -hmm. and they they even give that that feedback then, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, so that that's the kind of lived embodiment of of what what we are speaking about this year and not just transcendence but then meeting people in this kind of open-hearted way yeah yeah that's what really counts the interesting part that you described was the choice that you have i think um there's an inner discernment that comes about right and for some reason the orientation it seems to be toward an open-heartedness, like you said. For some reason, I want to choose love in these moments. And yeah. it makes life better for me and also the other person that I'm loving, you know? So it's like, there is a choice. You could choose to judge the person based upon their actions or how they look or what they said, blah, 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 or with a sincere open-heartedness. And it comes quite apparent in the discernment that the open heartedness is the route to just having a good interaction, having a, just a better life altogether in all of our interactions, you know? Yes. It's yes. interesting. We, we have the choice. Yes. But choosing wisely is never to choose, um, an orientation of self and uh, an orientation of separateness. It's to be truly open hearted with your 
people that you're with in your life, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. The amazing thing is that living from this recognition, this kind of, you know, compassion, which, you know, it, it kind of just flowers in a sense naturally out yeah. of that, you know, and, and it's interesting that this is the case, you know, like you wouldn't necessarily expect that, that recognizing the emptiness of all things would somehow lead to compassion. You know, I don't yeah. think that's intuitively yeah. obvious for people when they hear that, you know, that they, they wouldn't think that this is the natural consequence of this, you know, yeah. and maybe, maybe it isn't in each and every case, but I think for the most part, that very much there is the sense of just when when this is your lived experience and you're not just awakened to this transcendence, but you're kind of living from that aware from this recognition, that this kind of compassion and wisdom can, can just arise in a much more natural way, which very importantly doesn't imply perfection. You know, and I think mm. it's kind of important to to emphasize that because it's very easy to to have these ideas of, oh, now I have to behave like the Buddha, you know, and <laughs> I have to be perfect in some sense. And that can also be a kind of limiting belief, kind of yeah. thinking that there is a particular way um, in which I have to express myself now just because I have this recognition of interconnected and of all yeah. things. Mm -hmm. But there is, there really isn't in, in, in my view, you know, maybe sometimes even like a real strong interference or even resorting to violence in some extreme cases could also be an act of compassion mm -hmm. you know, if you are protecting somebody for example and there's no other way to resolve the the situation i know like some people would maybe say that that's not even a possibility when you're aware from this space but i would say it is i would say that that can also be a kind of wise and compassionate response that's of course an extreme example yeah, I'd say for the most part, that's we're not too often in situations where that's necessary, I'd say. But my point is just that we shouldn't kind of limit how this expression uh, is possible. You know, the, the, there is a kind of inherent um, yeah, compassion and wisdom there, interconnectedness, which guides one's behavior, you know, but how exactly that manifests can can really vary. And it's I think it's important to not have this kind of judging part of us come in there and then say, oh, but, you know, your behavior there, that's really not aligned with awakening, you know? Yeah. Because that that is a really sort of delusional way to look at it as well. You know, what we have to remember as well is that behavior, acting, it always takes place in conventional reality, right? And conventional reality is always based on viewpoints, you know, of, of my viewpoint and other people's viewpoints. And as we all know, we all have radically different ways of viewing, you know, different ways of judging, yeah. different ways of what is perfect. So how could we ever assess our perfection in our action? You know, it's, it's really a kind of impossibility, which on the, on the other side, I'm not saying that it's all equal, like there is no, more or less awakened behavior, I think there is, there is a sort of wise discernment there. But I think the idea of perfection is something we should maybe throw out. Awakening and embodiment is sort of a totally open-ended process, right? That we, we, there's no clear finish line there where you could ever say, yeah. you are now the perfect embodiment of awakening. What does that even mean? Who could ever assess what that means? You know, yeah. it, it, it's really it, any kind of assessment would be based on a kind of relative viewpoint of a person, right? But nevertheless, it's also apparent that there is such a thing as behavior that is coming from this awakened place and behavior that is clearly not. And it's not just a kind of intellectual differentiation, but it's apparent as you're performing the action, it is actually apparent to yourself. Maybe not initially, but I think eventually that becomes more and more clear. Yeah. Even in small things. Yeah. 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 I agree. It's that um, love is the orientation, but we're not quite able to embody that fully, if that makes sense. Because we, we have a lot of stuff to work through <laughs> collectively. Yeah. Yeah. That, that of course is almost always the case, you know, and you know, I 
a, a, a there's sometimes there's this distinction drawn between kind of sudden awakening and gradual awakening. And I like the idea of sudden awakening. And I think some my approach very much is kind of rooted in that and the possibility of directly, immediately recognizing the wholeness of, of your true nature, the perfection that is already there. But with that, to me, also is always this piece of gradual cultivation of that, you know, yeah. and in two senses at least. Yeah. Yes. In, in one sense, because I'd say even with the sudden awakening, there are still, I'd say almost always, a lot of limiting beliefs we have about the nature of our experience, which are sometimes maybe even quite quite subtle. And on the embodiment level, again, there is a lot of gradual cultivation to be done there. Like all these neurotic patterns, which we have trained ourselves into maybe for many years, they don't just kind of vanish instantly. That's at least not my experience. I don't think that's a realistic expectation. So I was speaking about my um, kind of social anxiety I had as a, as a teenager. And that wasn't something that just vanished all of a sudden. But with this shift, there was a totally different way of operating now possible. And that kind of contraction, it just decreased and decreased and decreased. And then opened up this totally way, different way of being with people that previously was unthinkable for me, you know, but there was very much a kind of, and still is, as I said, open-ended, you know, kind of gradual unfolding there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And here you are in a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you even imagine that before? No, my, my, you know, my day-to-day -day job where I speak with strangers yeah, every day, yeah. you know, that, mm -hmm. that would have been unthinkable for me, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I couldn't, I couldn't even have a conversation with someone without being anxious about the fact that I don't know what to say next. You know, <laughs> that's how much in my head I was, you know, and, and that was kind of my only way of being, so to say, yeah. I mean, kind of, kind of depends on who I was with and wasn't always that extreme, but yeah, very often it was. Mm -hmm. And that probably messed up what you wanted to say next, worrying about what you want to say next, Ab right? Absolutely. That's uh, <laughs> it's one way to not uh, come across as very uh, relaxed and comfortable. And <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, man. And that surrender is a sort of um, kind of letting your hands off the steering wheel a little bit, it seems, you know? Yeah, that it definitely, it, I would definitely say it is. Um, but you know, there's, there's kind of an aspect of awakening, which it, it, it sort of pertains to the second kind of non duality I spoke about, this non duality between conventional life and, and, and this awakening. Um, and that is that we can even allow a sort of intentionality to arise again to kind of fully re-enter the perspective of the person again, but do so with a totally different sense of the subject and the object of experience, you know, mm. and do so in a kind of, yeah, it, it's like you're not this detached witness, which is now watching everything unfold, yeah. but in some sense you are fully involved with what you're doing, totally immersed in it, but also at the same time, recognizing everything to be this empty awareness, you know, mm -hmm. this transcendent quality. Mm -hmm. And that that really is part of the second kind of non-duality, this cultivation of embodiment for me, you know, where, you know, the, the way of describing it, like you're just watching it all unfold, not saying that's a wrong way of looking at it at all. And that's also a useful perspective to have. And it's true in some fundamental sense, because guess what? Everything is just unfolding. <laughs> it's, that is just in a fundamental sense what is happening. But it's also, there's a, maybe sometimes a subtle danger there to slip into a kind of detached witnessing position, you know, and be kind of uninvolved from life and thereby creating yeah. even a sense of separation there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to say we are the viewer of the movie and the movie at the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that emphasizes that non-separation. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> it's good stuff, man. I don't even know where to go. Um, <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. Wherever you want to go. <laughs> yeah. 
so how did this start for you? Where did this, uh, was there a moment, you know, this transcending moment for you where it all happened? If you want to get into that. Yeah, I mean, so all that, like when, when we're talking about these stories, it's always a question of how far do we want to zoom out, you know, and, and, you know, there, there's so many ways to, to slice a cake and I could present my, my story in a, ver a variety of different ways, you know, and which I probably do, um, depending on the, on the circumstances, like where, where, where I put the emphasis, but you probably mean that in a very kind of awakening oriented way, right? How, how did that all start for me? And yeah. Yeah. When did you get the glimpse, you know, the taste? Taste of oh, the okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, even that is kind of harder to answer than it might, you might suspect or listeners might, might suspect because looking back then, the thing is always that it's so clear that th this was always and already the case in your experience. And there have in fact been many glimpses, which yeah. sort of just go unacknowledged you know yeah it's not like you were ever separate from that you were ever apart from it and you were ever truly out of it but you were in some sense just so hypnotized by your interpretations so grasping and contracted to them that you kind of overlooked what's already and always so you know so in that sense it's almost hard to say when the the big shift happened because yeah it's, it's almost like um pulling something apart that can't really be pulled apart. Yeah. But um, when I first became interested in meditation, I think it was still very much from a kind of self-improvement view. You know, I, yeah. I was really into martial arts. And then I also saw the possibility of, okay, I can't just train my body in a deliberate way, but also train my mind in a very deliberate way. Great. So just another way I can kind of improve myself, you know, and another martial work on art. this. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of just improve this this project of myself you know so it's very much in a sort of kind of rational way i was approaching it and uh and very in a yeah i i was probably a sort of maybe i didn't use this term back then but a metaphysical materialist as well you know mm -hmm. like thinking that consciousness is somehow produced by the brain you know and yep. we're living in a world of matter you know same and, and and all of that yeah and that was very much kind of my what i was immersed in I, I, I mean, I did grow up religious. I, I grew up Christian, but um, I kind of left the f that faith when I was 13 because it just, there were so many <laughs> logical inconsistencies there and mm -hmm. nobody could give me like satisfying answers. So I yeah. sort of rejected that. And then I, I guess I had more kind of a materialistic, scientific uh, worldview. But even just starting meditation, it's still... You know, even if you approach it from that kind of view, it still kind of opens you up in interesting ways because at the very least, you discover that what I said in the beginning, that there are different ways of experiencing, different ways of being, you know, even if you kind of um, frame that in, a, in this materialistic scientific view, you know, that, that still opens you up in, in some sense. And in the beginning, I was, for the most part, I was practicing uh, in Vipassana style and went to retreats and in Vipassana retreats, silent retreats. And I, I, and I really enjoyed it. It was really helpful for me. And, and just psychologically, I could tell there were many improvements. But um, one of the teachers on one of the retreats, he also integrated sort of more non-dual practices. And as soon I, as I heard of the possibility that you can actually sort of go to your true nature directly, I immediately, immediately I thought, well, why not do that? Because <laughs> I'm I very much, uh, I love just simplicity in general and a kind of directness. And so that was very appealing to me. And so then I, I really became fascinated by all kinds of traditions and approaches which have this common understanding that you're already it, so to say, mm -hmm. that your true nature is always already accessible, can't be improved upon. It's just there to be discovered, you know? Mm. And then I think there was a, a good phase of frustration where I really wanted to have this glimpse, but was struggling really hard with it as well because mm. I felt like I couldn't get it. And at one point I was uh, meditating with, with my wife, girlfriend then. Um, and after the meditation, I think she, she asked me like, why, why is your heart beating so fast? You know, because we just, 
meditated, you kind of expect you to calm down. Mm -hmm. But I was struggling so hard to to have a glimpse of of true nature, you know, non duality. Mm -hmm. That I kind of put myself under tremendous stress, you know, where sometimes maybe maybe even I thought about kind of forgetting this project and dropping it, you know. And um, there was certainly one moment in particular that sticks out for me after that, where, you no, know, it's almost, I, I kind of hesitate to speak about it in this way because it just makes it sound, it sounds too too mystical and special. And I don't want it to come across this way because I said it's it's available for everyone. There's nothing special about it in that sense. But I had, a, had one night I had a dream, you know, it is really a strange kind of dream where I just saw this image of, um, lightning striking the ground. And there was this, this expansion of energy all the way out into infinity, a sort of, and immediately I, I kind of had the association of expansion of consciousness, you know, uh -huh. opening up into unlimited, unlimitedness. You know? And I don't know if it was a day after, but, or a couple of days after that, but I was looking out of my window, quite ordinary. And all of a sudden, it just became totally clear that everything is just this pristine field of awakeness. That was kind of the description I had after that. Wow. And with that, and I think that's what, what was really powerful for me, was the sense that I can never really lose this. Even if I somehow overlook it tomorrow, I know I will always get back here. I knew that just with absolute conviction. And and that, I think, was the important shift in my sort of spiritual practice in some sense. But um, to say that it was totally smooth sailing after that would, of course, be totally wrong. You know, I, mm -hmm. As I said earlier, a lot of gradual cultivation still had to happen and still is happening, you know, mm -hmm. so... But but it was a shift in the sense that uh, there was almost a kind of faith in our total confidence and the reality of this, you know, and that I would always find back there. And that was psychologically, just on a purely psychological level as well, I think that was very important for me. Mm, it's quite intriguing. You never really lose this. Yes, you, you can't. You can't really. And even when it seems like you do in any given instant, at best, it's just a phase of kind of, ignorance the short-lived phase of ignorance and yeah. you you come out of that again as well yeah. yeah i feel as though that's the most awe-inspiring realization is that this it you can never lose it because you never yes. lost it that's the you know that's like, but the, go ahead sorry it, uh, no no uh, i mean it's just interesting that you know when i when it's when we use these kinds of descriptions you can never lose it you're already it you know it's already here Interestingly, for a lot of people, that is frustrating, you know, yeah. and I kind of get it because I, I, I told you like my kind of frustration and struggle with this earlier. Because sometimes people hear this and then they say, okay, great, but that's not, that's not uh, apparent in my experience. So, so how does that help me, you know? Mm. And I totally feel these people, you know, I totally get what they mean. And so when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that from a position of, Oh, it's so beautiful over here. You know, I wish you could, you could have this experience. <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. You can get there in a very deliberate and effective way, in my view. And this is really, again, possible for everyone. It doesn't require anything special, you know, and each and everyone, I believe, can do this, has at the possibility of having this kind of shift in their, in their orientation. And, you know, why I don't really emphasize these awakening experiences is that don't don't wait for something mystical or magical to happen, you know, the way I just kind of described it. Just work at it and allow this transformation to happen gradually. And you don't need any kind of incredible awakening experience. This can, can just become obvious in a very, very subtle way. And I would say that kind of gradual, sudden development is much more important than these mystical sort of explosions because that at the end of the day is what makes up your life. You know, the way in which you integrate this in your day-to-day, moment-by-moment experience, the extent to which this is obvious at the end of the day, this is what's important, you know, not, not these kinds of transcendent experiences. Because guess what? 
you'll have to come back down to earth anyway. And yeah. then, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're back in this embodiment. Yeah. <laughs> you always come back down. Yeah, exactly. So don't don't cling for these experiences, right? Beautiful yeah. as they are, and they they can be valuable. I mean, we shouldn't push them away either. As I said, it gave me a confidence which I desperately needed at the time. You know, so it was important, but it's not like you need it in any any real way. Yeah, there's a weird irony in there. It's like we want it so bad, we seek so much to come to eventually an end of seeking. And in that is a realization that you never needed to seek anything in the first place. Yeah. It's but sort you of the, did. the irony of it all. Yeah, but you did. Because you know, it's like, yeah, it's there's irony in there. It's some kind of like weird joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can definitely view it as a kind of cosmic joke uh, to some degree, but, and, and who knows why this happens. I mean, people try to give these explanations for why ignorance is even possible, you know, and is, is it your karma? Did a demon create this? Was it a devil who created the ignorance? Where, where does it all come from? But at the end of the day, also, who cares? You know, we're here. This is what's happening. Yeah. There's a possibility of waking up out of this. Yeah. You know, of a totally different way of living. That's on the menu. So, <laughs> it's yeah, on the why menu. not? Why not take that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. So, I guess, would you recommend maybe just a uh, regular meditation, just a regular, disciplined practice of self inquiry? Yeah, in general I, um, sense. yeah, I mean, uh, whether meditation is necessary, I think is an interesting question. I, I would say that whether you call it meditation or not, but at least some dedicated time where one deliberately looks at one's experience mm -hmm. and kind of learns to relax out of these grasping fixations and come to this recognition of empty awareness that I think would almost be needed for for almost everyone. You know, I, again, I never, I would never say everyone because there's an infinite amount of ways of maybe coming to this realization. But if if I would instruct somebody, I would certainly do so through a kind of meditative approach. But it's a very sort of directed approach where it's not about building concentration or becoming more focused or not even creating kind of more positive states. But it's really in the spirit of inquiry into your experience and learning what's already and always true about um, what's here. And I do like to supplement it depending on like if I'm speaking with somebody who is very overwhelmed with emotions, for example, then I will also kind of maybe lean into more positive states and find ways of cultivating them skillfully. But it's all just scaffolding for this recognition of true nature, you know, what's in, what's inherently so. You know, mm -hmm. and. And then one, one, when one has a kind of um, confidence in the ability to recognize in a, in a relative sense, then sort of formal meditation, I think, becomes less and less necessary. And in fact, before I um, started this channel, I did very little meditation in a kind of sit down and meditate way. But it was always in a sort of integrated in my life way, where every moment was a kind of meditation which was a non-meditation because at the end of the day it's not like you're trying to create something but i think um in the beginning it might very well be indispensable to take some time to honestly um explore this and come to a more direct recognition and once one has that i think then sort of formal meditation isn't as as important anymore can still be beautiful and profound and really help in this kind of gradual cultivation sense. So I'm not dismissing meditation at all, you know, but uh, I'd say it's just not as necessary anymore. I got you. Your life is the meditation, right? Yes. Th there's mm -hmm. the real possibility of that. Not mm -hmm. just in a cliche kind of way, but mm -hmm. actually really experiencing it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that is beautiful. It all has to do with like attention right? Like honing in on one's attention through deliberate examination. And 
what are we fixating our attention on? You know, it seems like it's a mental muscle that we kind of have to, I don't know, we have to work out a little bit until we can bring it into, like we said before, into our regular life and place attention on things that are important and worthwhile in our life. It, it's certainly an aspect of it. Um, so I would say, and it, maybe that goes a bit into my my map of, of awakening or how I usually like to approach this. Um, the first step is really more of a, of a, if anything, a letting go of attention of, you know, because that one of the biggest frustrations people have and one that I certainly had is that they try to find awareness with their attention, you know, which is an impossible task because it is not an object. You know, it is like trying to um, let your t attention onto something which is an empty space. You know, you can't really do it. So the, the first step really is a learning to open up, settle back and relax into this already established space, you know. So it's and finding attention an, through awareness. Yeah, the the attention almost kind of doesn't really uh, matter in in this way. This first kind of step of approaching it, mm -hmm. it is kind of a opening up. I first usually guide people to kind of open up the attention to get to a sort of more spacious awareness, yeah. and then allowing this space to fall and settle back into what's already perfectly established. And then there are really kind of specific instructions one can give to make this more clear or more directed to, to sort of fall back maybe through the looker and discover this clarity and vastness and centerlessness of awareness. And one basically discovers that awareness, being aware of itself, is not something we do through our in attention. You know, it doesn't yeah. use the mind and it also doesn't refer back to thought. You know, we don't have to check back, am I in it? You know, is this is this it? It's much more like when you're standing on one leg and balancing, you kind of have this intuitive sense of it, right? And so in a similar way, with this opening up and relaxing into it, there's this kind of intuitive knowing of awareness, knowing itself just by being itself, right? And the mm -hmm. example that is often given there is like a fire illuminates the outside world and itself. And so too, our true nature illuminates itself just by being itself. The fire doesn't have to try extra hard to illuminate itself, its being is illumination, right? And so to this empty awareness, this awake presence, is just knowing itself just by being itself, becomes obvious to itself just by being itself. And for the most part, the first step kind of, the, in the way I like to approach it, as, as I said, this is just a suggestion. It's not like this is the way to go, right? But, um, yeah, this first step is really a kind of unhooking of this grasping, opening up of space, falling back, settling back into this awakeness, which is already here. And then one can first kind of marinate in that, you know, become more acquainted with that, uh, with this recognition in, in of itself, before then moving on to these other kinds of steps, breaking down these non-dualities between um, perception and awareness, and then eventually awakening and ordinary life and, and looking at all our limiting beliefs. So this is sort of a staging ground from which one can then work, you know, rather than it's, it's not just about kind of zooming out and hanging out in kind of transcendent space, but it's a very useful staging ground and very psychologically healing as well to first discover this essential unboundedness, centerlessness, wholeness, which is already inherent in, in awareness itself. And then, reintegrating all of our experience after that mm, all set i got you that's good damn good stuff man <laughs> i mean ultimately could you sum it up and say with that awareness the phenomena the comings and going of your life um just easier to bear there is actually in fact less suffering in your life absolutely i mean uh that was you know when you asked me that first question of what what is what is all of this about yes you know that that is the promise you know because uh again um not trying to make this seem to i'm not trying to overhype awakening so to say but if i compare my experience now to how it was 10 years ago 
I never would have thought it's possible to have this peace and sense of wholeness and meaningfulness and interconnectedness and beauty in life, you know? So it's a total upgrading, so to say, you know, of the way of being. Mm -hmm. And and so, yes, that is the, the, I suppose the sales pitch, you know, that this is a, this shift is possible. You know, it's, yeah. it's possible. We don't have to live in this suffering contracted self-identifying limited way mm -hmm. there, there, there are different possibilities there. Yeah. A more natural way, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's extremely natural. I mean, it's why it's called the natural state because it's as natural as it gets, you know, it's more effortless than breathing. You know, it's just uh -huh. always here. You know, this is a beautiful thing. This is why this relaxing thing is so powerful because I'm not even saying that you need to do something to make this happen or to become aware of it. You know, you don't even need your attentional system to do that. You know, this is why at the end of an exhausting, exhausting workday, this is just as, as accessible because you're not using your attention to go there to find it. You know, it's, it's, it's always just here and there to be enjoyed, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. it kind of becomes miraculous it is absolutely Personally speaking you know i feel like in it that is. awareness it comes like a constant feeling that i'm in some kind of miracle absolutely <laughs> right? yes and we're part of the miracle all of us we're all part of this miracle yes. creating co-creating this miracle this uh this how is anything happening how is this possible you know yeah it's we can't comprehend this the mind cannot comprehend this but yet it is you know, it this is the way reality is that's what we're doing right yeah. now. yeah <laughs> it's it's fun you know it's fun to try but <laughs> yeah <At laughs> ultimately day, yeah we we won't we won't be able to pin it down you know we won't mm -hmm. it's impossible that's the good news though imagine if we were able to quote pin it down uh, mm -hmm. that would be like the yeah. I don't know, that's the end how we'd get bored with it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's actually for me a positive thing that we'll never be able to figure this out that we're in this constant mystery that is seemingly miraculous at the same time yeah yes yeah you're you're falling you're falling into the depths of your being but that's not scary you know because the only thing that hurts you is landing, but you don't land anywhere yeah, here, yeah. you know? This it's is a just quote this... I heard the other day is that we're in a free fall, but there's no, we're never going to reach the, uh, we're never going to reach the ground. We're just completely free yes. falling. Exactly. You know, this, this ground of awareness is in fact groundless. You know, there's nothing to hold onto there. You know, there's no, again, it's like space, you know? Hmm. Well, hey, um, I don't know where else to go from here. Um, oh, it was a great talk. <laughs> yeah, you want to wrap this thing up? Do you have any last words that you want to get off your chest? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, if anybody wants to um, get in touch with me, um, you can find my um, channel on, on YouTube. It's uh, Sam Go, G-O-W. Or my, um, my website is sam-go.com. You can... Get in touch with me there as well and yeah that's basically it i, I guess it's, it's all there is to know but i really enjoyed talking to you and really enjoyed your your questions and yeah, you know, the, the great thing in, in talking about this it's also all it's, it's like a meditation as well i always yeah. feel like when we when one talks about these things you know it mm -hmm. brings to the foreground what's what's already and always so mm -hmm. i agree this is uh i like to say part of my sadhana doing this with yeah. other people it's uh yes. it is it's a it's a collaborative meditation in a way exactly and and other people get to partake as well which is beautiful yeah, yeah. right the win-win for everybody yeah <laughs> well thank you man i appreciate your time effort and wisdom that you brought to this conversation keep on keeping on um i think you can and are going to help many people uh so yeah, I can't emphasize it enough. Keep doing your thing. And thank you for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And likewise, keep doing what you do. For sure.
Thank you for anybody that listened this long in the future. And uh, peace and love. Peace and yep. love.